Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to JA Personal Finance Workshops. I'm Michelle Merkel, President of Junior Achievement in Mahoney Valley. And this afternoon, we have Michael Alexander from TCF Bank, who will be presenting to us today on risk management. Oh, <laughs> I'm excited to learn more about <laughs> risk management. Um, but at this time, I'd like to turn the session over to Mike. Welcome. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Um, well, good, good afternoon, I guess, just for a few minutes now. But uh, risk management is very exciting. I, uh, uh, as Michelle mentioned, I'm at TCF Bank. I work in the wealth management group, which is uh, effectively private banking and investments. But I've spent my entire career in banking, um, which is almost 19 years now, believe it or not. Um, so we, risk management is very crucial to what we do in many different ways. But um, you'll see throughout this, hopefully, and we'll have some time at the end for some questions, um, what really is meant by risk management and how it can actually pertain to your everyday life. It has nothing to do with whether you own a business or if you're looking at it from the standpoint of what your ultimate job would be someday, it's really about your own personal finance, as you already know, because that's what we're talking about in these sessions. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and share my screen. You may see me looking at a piece of paper because, you know, I didn't want to be fumbling around today. Um, but we, like I said, we'll have some time at the end for some Q&A. But throughout this, I'm going to be referencing this uh, PowerPoint that you're seeing now, hopefully. Um, and uh, there will be a session, or I should say a section within the session where there is a question and answer section where there'll be some either true or false or multiple choice. Unfortunately, we don't have the ability to do like an interactive today where we actually wait for your answers, but I'll ask you when we do this, and I'll remind you at that time, to see the question and think about what answer you would give. Um, because that's really the best way to test your knowledge is to kind of just take a quick look at it. Um, Okay, as I mentioned, you know, personal finance is the practice of determining and managing a person's financial needs and goals for the future. Um, personal finances and personal fitness are very alike. So as you'll see throughout this, and I, I know you've seen it in the other sessions, we're gonna talk about a warm up, a sprint, the training, and then the cool down. It's much like a, an exercise or a workout. So that's why we're equating these together because they really are um, similar in that way. Um, as you can see on the screen here, we're looking at the different lessons that you had. I'll be doing risk management now, and then if you know, I'll be actually doing investing after this if you're going to be around for that. So let's get started here. Risk management. And we're going to start, like I said, with the warm up. So the first thing that we will talk about is some of the definitions involved with risk management. So the best way to describe risk is something. As you can see, the possibility of financial loss or physical harm. So when you talk about a risky enterprise, whether it's investing in a, in a, you know, in a business or in a stock, as I'm sure you've seen on the news lately or things of that nature, there's always the risk for a financial loss. If you're talking about physical harm, you know, risky activities such as you know, rock climbing and things like that would actually, God forbid, cause a physical harm. So that's really where it kind of ties in. Um, potential for financial loss can be great. It could be actually an ongoing negative impact to the way that your business functions or your personal finances, finances will work. It can also be related to, like I said, the way that you um, manage that to try to prevent that risk. So like I said, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that going forward here. Risk management. I uh, kind of gave away this, but it's the practice of predicting and minimizing the chance of that financial loss. So obviously risk is inherent with everything you do. There's always a risk there. Uh, I'll give you a banking example because that's, you know, as I mentioned, that's what I know. Um, banking, there's a risk that a client um, would take advantage of some of the policies that the bank has and try to scam or steal money. Um, that might be through depositing a large check that is known to be fraudulent and they're hoping to take the funds out of the bank before we've determined that and they've effectively stolen money from the bank. So a way that the bank would you know, predict and minimize this chance of loss through risk management would to have policies in place to review that check item, 
put a potential hold so that you can't actually access those funds until the other bank has released the funds from that and verified that the, the check is good, that type of uh, a behavior or a policy. Another way I like to describe it for risk management is insurance, um, which we'll get to just here in a minute, but insuring a product that you own, such as your car or home, is a way of managing the loss of financial or the risk of financial loss. Um, it's one of the four ways, as a matter of fact. So we'll get to that in just a second. Um, sorry, my screen's flickering. Please, if, if Michelle tells me you can't see it, let me know. Okay, Michelle. Oh, I skipped over. Sorry. There we go. I'm back on. So as you see, this person here on the subway is, is covering what I assume to be a cough. One of the risks that could potentially happen with personal um, risk or physical harm would be that someone would make you sick. Um, someone would have the, the cold or for that matter right now, obviously the coronavirus and you could be sick just from being around that person. So that's one of the risks associated. One way to manage that type of risk would be to um, wear your mask, wash your hands, all the things that you're seeing and all the recommendations from the CDC right now. So I hope I'm drawing a correlation for you with that. This is um, related to the physical risks, but my, I apologize, I don't wanna skip over anything. I wanna get to some of the more content because my computer's starting to give me a little grief. Okay, so as I mentioned, there are four different types of uh, ways for risk management. So ways to, um, to handle those risks that, that will come. The first is avoidance. So you can avoid the, the type of activity that could be causing a risk. So like I said before about rock climbing, the risk for rock climbing is that you could hurt yourself. The best way to, to manage that risk is not to go rock climbing, just to avoid that entirely. The next is a control or reduction policy procedure method. So in the, in, in the example I gave with the bank, we have a policy in place to control the type of uh, losses that we can incur and reduce the amount of um, effective loss or risk by having a plan in place. The third option or third type of dealing with this is transfer. This is something else I managed, or I mentioned rather with life insurance, house insurance, car insurance, that kind of thing. This is transferring the financial loss associated with the risk to somebody else. Meaning it's still gonna happen. God forbid the house catches on fire. The house is still going to be a loss, but me as the owner will have transferred that loss to the insurance company by paying for an insurance policy. So they will pay me to rebuild my house. So really, I have taken on the cost of the insurance, but not the financial loss of the house burning down. And then the final way uh, to deal with risk is to just accept it. So acceptance is probably the most common when you're talking about a, a physical loss or physical harm, but the least common when you're talking about financial. The reason for that is if I mentioned again, the rock climbing, which I'm sure you're already sick of hearing about just on the third time here, if you just want to do it, you're just going to accept that that's a possible risk that you're taking and you're going to go ahead. Um, much like investing, if there's a business that you really feel strongly about, but there's reasons why you probably shouldn't invest in it, you may still go ahead and do so and just accept the fact that there could be a financial loss there. Okay. Okay, so as I, I kind of uh, jumped the gun on these, but at, for avoidance, as I've already mentioned, this is the choice to just eliminate or skip that risk that you could potentially have with financial or physical harm. Um, so again, just not taking part in the activity that could cause you a loss. Control and, and reduction, again, like I said, something that you can do to lower the risk. Um, and, and take on what they refer to, or we would refer to as a so select acceptable losses, meaning there's still a loss that you can get that the policy could not cover because, you know, maybe that check isn't um, effectively fraudulent, but somebody stopped payment on it after it's already been paid out to that customer or something like that, not to get too technical, but there's always ways that it could still happen. 
and that not every policy could cover every opportunity for loss. Transfer, as I mentioned with the insurance, it's the choice to share the risk of the financial loss with another party, such as an insurance provider. So that's pretty easy and obvious. Acceptance, the choice to personally take on the risk of the financial loss, as I mentioned. So you just you know, educate yourself on what could happen both physically and financially and choose to accept that if that's something you wanna do. So I know that you can't partake in this, but I wanted to try to use these, this as a, a way to kind of drive home some of those points. So as we're looking at this, please try to think of what you would choose for the answer to these questions. So in the case of buying travel insurance on a plane ticket, what type of risk management would that be? Avoidance, control and reduction, transfer or acceptance? Installing a security alarm in your home. Choosing not to start a business that could lose money. And finally, borrowing money to start a business that could be profitable. So let me see if my answers are correct and you can test your knowledge as well. There we go. So if we're gonna still go ahead and start that business, even though we could potentially lose money there, we're accepting that risk. If we're buying insurance on a plane ticket that maybe we are unfit to travel, whether we have you know coronavirus or there's weather in the area or something like that, we're gonna transfer that risk to the insurance company. If we install a security alarm, we're not eliminating the, the possibility that there could be a burglary or a, you know, other type of um, risk to the home. We're just doing our best to control and reduce that. And then finally, if we choose not to open that business, we're just avoiding that, that risk entirely. So this will be our strength in part. As I mentioned before, we did the warm up, the, you know, the the strengthening, and then we'll go to the cool down here in a bit. This is the interactive part that we cannot do as a group, unfortunately, because it would take some partnering and some paperwork and things. What I do want to show you, however, if I can switch screens here, and I apologize if I cause a problem, is this would have been one of the handouts that you would have received. This is the risk management scenarios. So hopefully you're seeing these where we would have taken each of these little squares and put them on their own, uh, you know, little card for you to use. And what we would have done is talk through this. So I'll just use the first example just to give you an idea of what um, we were unable to accomplish here virtually, but just so you're aware of what we would do. So in a small group, you would look at scenario one. So one group would have scenario one. Sergio owns a new smartphone. He carries it in his back pocket and it fell out into water. So obviously the risk there is that the phone will likely not work unless it's one of the newer expensive ones that is waterproof. Also, he's carrying it in his back pocket. If he forgets and sits down, he could you know, crack it or break it or what have you. So there are definitely multiple ways that you could manage that risk of, of breaking your new smartphone. Some of those I'll give you real quickly. Avoidance would be just not carry it with you. I mean, it sounds silly, but if you don't have it, you don't have that risk of breaking it, losing it, or dropping it in the water. Transferring it would be having insurance on it. I know most companies offer insurance on these products so that if they have, a, you know, if they're broken or lost or damaged, that you can get them replaced at somebody else's expense. Um, obviously, there's a fee for it, but not the total financial loss. Um, acceptance would be just to accept it. Just know that it could break and you'll have to replace it someday. So you're just eliminating the, the worry of that loss, but not the loss in general. And then finally, control and avoidance or reduction would be to put a case on the phone, um, maybe even a waterproof one for that matter, and to just try to be very careful with the phone and try to be very um, cautious of what you do with it in general as part of your everyday type of activities. So I just wanted to give you a quick example of what unfortunately we can't do right now. Um, just given the virtual environment we're in. But as you can see, there are a number of these 
And, you know, I, I'm sure that you would enjoy doing something like this because it really helps you to learn the different ways of looking at things and what different uh, opportunities there are for risk management. So let's go back to our, hopefully we're back to the PowerPoint here. So I, I'm gonna skip the instructions as you saw because we did already look at those scenarios and we'll go to the next slide, which is our sprint. So we've warmed up, we've strengthened, and we've now are gonna do a sprint. So the risky trivia, again, unfortunately, you won't be able to interactively um, cooperate or participate if you will, but we'll try to do the same thing we did previously where we will uh, go through these questions and we'll take just a few minutes before we click on the answer so that you can see what you would think you'd answer to the question before I click ahead. So we'll go ahead and start with number one. Car insurance is an example of which risk management strategy? Anybody think it's transfer? Perfect, transfer. Number two, what is the most important method of preventing financial loss? Most important, not most common. I actually think I may have skipped over this to be honest, so it's probably gonna be difficult for you to know but that is personal responsibility. So I did, I did skip over this. So I'll take just a second now to explain. Personal responsibility, as, I, as I've kind of been alluding to throughout, is what do you do to either prevent this loss? What actions do you take? How do you treat the option of, or I should say the product or service or whatever it is that you're trying to prevent loss on? So are you carrying insurance on the house? Are you doing things responsibly to prevent this type of loss to begin with. Anything that's not within your control is those, those loss, those risks that you can't control, of course. Um, but what can you do to prevent this from happening in the first place? So I apologize, I kind of jumped the gun there. Number three, true or false, avoiding risk is always the best strategy. False. If you avoided every risk, you could never potentially start a business. You could never make any money. You can never in, you know, enjoy activities that you wanna do at the risk of you know, physical harm. And certainly you'd never invest any money because there's options for losing money when you invest. And that would be impossible if you avoided it. Finally, installing fire alarms in a sprinkler system is an example of which risk management strategy? It's probably not transfer. Would it be control and reduction? Perfect. So we've answered all the questions. We're gonna go ahead and skip forward. Let's see if I have, okay. So just to review, the risk of financial, are, uh, the risk of financial loss or, or physical harm is inherent to everyone. Uh, it's something that you can't, uh, get rid of, but you can do your best to control uh, it through risk management. The four main ways of risk management are, or strategies, I should say, are avoidance, control and reduction, transfer through insurance, and just ultimate exam acceptance. And then again, personal responsibility is the most important method of preventing the financial loss in the first place. So that's where I kind of uh, unfortunately skipped over that to the end, but um, we did get the chance to talk about that. That is really it, because what the next section would be is the quiz and the additional pantomime activity that we can't really do virtually. So I think we're going to be pretty early here for the question and answer. So I see there are a few typed, uh, and then we can open it up to try to ask some more um, if anybody is interested in doing so. I will start with what's typed here. You want me to read the questions to you, Mike? Is that okay? I, I, I'm finally able to see them. I'm sorry that that happened there while we were trying to skip ahead, but I see four right now. Yeah, so, um, so the first question is, you mentioned insurance. Do I need a car insurance when I purchase my first car? Um, the simple answer is absolutely yes, um, for a couple different reasons. One, 
it's obviously necessary if you should be in an accident or lose the opportunity to use that car, that would be the financial loss. Um, the greater financial loss is not just that physical car and having to pay to replace it, but also if you can't get to your job or get to the doctor or something, there's other losses that you can incur as well. But the second yes answer to that is it's legally required. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of um, liability or, or minimum liability. You hear these commercials for the general and Geico and everything. You're legally required to have uh, insurance on your car because if you crash into someone else, you have to be able to cover the damages that you cause to them, both for their car and hopefully not, but any physical damage you cause to them uh, uh, personally as well. Yeah, I think that's an option you have to have and you don't have a choice. Yeah. Um, so Aflac, what is supplemental insurance? <laughs> this is also interesting. And obviously you see commercials for it. The, I, I love that doc. I think it was smart for them to have that. And it's lasted a long time. But, you know, we were joking about this the other day, not to take up too much time, but insurance companies have had the longest standing commercials I can think of. They must spend more money than anybody, but, you know, maybe beer companies on, on marketing. But supplemental insurance like uh, Aflac and, and some others, it's additional insurance obviously the name supplemental on top of what is covered under a standard policy. So the best way to explain such a thing is when, you know, to use the commercial again, if you're in an accident, for instance, you might have short-term disability insurance with your employer and the insurance that would cover the vehicle that you're in, a, in an accident with and things like that. But if you are breaking your leg or something where you can't go back to your job, it would pay additional bills that you incur by not being able to cut your own grass or to you know, have to get rides to um, doctor's appointments or things like that. So it's actually gonna be supplemental on top of what is paid through a standard bank or a standard insurance policy. So that's a good one. It covers very the, good, very common. Yes. Very. Very good. Now, does your bank offer insurance? We currently do not. Um, banks had always in the past offered insurance through what they called a uh, credit insurance product, where if you did a loan, for instance, either for a car or a home mortgage or things like that, we had a policy that we were legally allowed to sell um, through a third party provider, of course, but it would cover the amount of insurance uh, debt that you have with the bank. So if, if you did a homeowner's or a home purchase through a mortgage and you owed 200,000 on a house, um, few years down the road, you pass away. Someone would be required to pay that, you know, probably $150,000 or more that's still due on that house. But this policy would pay it off. Um, it would have a monthly cost, much like any other insurance policy, but it would cover that debt that you have on the house. We do not sell it any longer. It was something that the uh, regulators have chosen not to allow the banks to do because they felt that it was you know, we weren't necessarily the best people to sell such a thing. You could still get that type of term insurance, but not through the bank. I don't know if they're thinking this way, but um, so I open up a checking account and with the bank mm -hmm. <laughs> and the bank gets robbed. Mm -hmm. What insurance do I have that, you know, <laughs> my money still in the bank. I, I, this is a question I do no, all the time. <laughs> that's a great question. And I'm kind of embarrassed. I didn't jump straight to that, Michelle, to yeah. be honest. Um, FDIC, I'm sure you've all heard of, it is stands for Federal Depository Insurance Company. That's what FDIC stands for. That is exactly what you just described, Michelle. It covers the deposits you have with the bank through a checking, savings, CD account, things of that nature, that if God forbid, the bank were to fail, um, not necessarily get robbed because there's other insurances that the bank carries on, on its own you know, assets, meaning the branch and the people involved and everything. But the if the bank should stop existing, the FDIC would actually come in and pay the amount that you have on deposit up to 250,000 per account, per ownership, for those losses that you would have otherwise incur. That's a, a form of transferring the insurance to the FDIC company. Great, because I know a lot of, I've heard this several times and this mistrust or if the bank got robbed or, and I'm like, no, you, it's FDIC. Yes. And it's insured and you know, there's no risk of losing your money. 
True. Um, True. Yes, but they have it. Um, let's check the other questions. How do I decide where to get my insurance? Woo. That, <laughs> that's a great question because it all depends on what you're looking for. So with regard to, you know, best decision you have for something like car insurance, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times it comes down just to cost. How much do you need and how much does it cost you? I know that I had uh, previously worked with a, a, a customer of mine that had an insurance company, and we actually parted ways because the company that he used to provide insurance was so much more expensive than what I was able to get elsewhere. Um, and it's really truthfully the same thing. You know, there, those companies are held to a requirement, um, Geico to use an example, or Safeco Insurance, which does a lot of advertising now. They, they're different in many ways with how much they cost because of how much they pay their people or how much marketing they do to go back to what I said about Geico and everything. But ultimately, they're required by the state to provide the same type of policy to everybody, regardless of the cost, essentially. So it's a lot of times based on what you need and how much you're going to be able to pay for that or how little you can pay for it in many cases, but also what type of insurance do you need? So generally the type of people that sell car insurance and homeowners insurance and things of that nature, they call it property and casualty insurance. They don't necessarily always sell life insurance also. Some do, some don't. Um, and, and many don't sell business uh, insurance either, which they call, um, I'm losing my train of thought, operational insurance. So if there are things you need, um, say lawyer, for instance, they might actually need malpractice insurance, much like a doctor would need, that prevents them from having financial losses if they are sued by one of their clients for something they feel they did wrong. So it, it's a really difficult thing to answer easily to say where to go and how to decide. But a lot of times it's just comparing, making sure that you don't just go with the first one you see and you know, reading all the fine print, so to speak. Yeah, and you touched that um, on a previous webinar session recording that we have. Is we discussed smart shopping and comparison shopping. Um, but I also, you know, touching on read the fine print. Would that be considered acceptance? I think a lot of us, you know, just go ahead and scroll down to the bottom and accept or mm -hmm. sign. Um, how as important is it to reading that fine print? I think it's incredibly important. And obviously people feel differently about it. I, I have been involved personally, as well as with customers of mine in enough situations where there are little clauses or terminology that ultimately are not in their best interest that they just never saw in the first place. You know, in, in the case of a, a client of mine who purchased a home in, in Florida, there's a clause that he cannot have additional flood insurance on that property that is not bought through the insurance provider that wrote the homeowner's policy. The big reason that that's a problem is they don't offer anywhere near enough coverage that what he would need to replace the property if it is damaged through fraud, uh, flood. And also it's much more expensive. So it's just in the fine print. Never would have seen it until he went to do the mortgage with us on that property and the bank was looking to see if we could provide the, uh, or I shouldn't say provide the insurance, but get a copy of the insurance he had and the cost was exorbitant. It was almost four times what he would pay otherwise because he stuck with the same provider. So there's other reasons why that's so important, but yes, to answer your question, reading it and accepting the terms is a form of acceptance. You know, you've already transferred the liability to the company and tried to help yourself out, but ultimately you may have to accept terms you don't really want. Yeah, so it is important to read the fine print. And like you said, some of that terminology um, is difficult to understand. Um, and I think recommendation would be to, you know, have another person look it over, mm -hmm. whether it's an attorney or a family member, if they are not sure what they are signing um, their name to and agree Absolutely. to. Uh, and, and agents, you know, some people will say negative about dealing with an agent versus doing it through the online banking or excuse me, just through an online purchase, but that's what they do for a living. So you have to put your faith in people sometimes and just know that they're really meant to be there for your benefit. So if you have questions, ask them and don't be afraid to push back. Sometimes we, you know, they always joke that everything is negotiable. I've heard that phrase before. It's kind of true. 
if you don't like something and you ask questions and you push back a little bit, sometimes you get what you want. Yeah. Well, we're close to our session. I know you're doing a back to back, but um, I'll allow for this one, this final question. Are there discounts on insurance for students? Yes. Um, actually, I just benefited from this. Uh, as a matter of fact, we changed our car insurance, um, as I mentioned, because it was too expensive. And um, my wife is a teacher. I'm a graduate of Youngstown State. Uh, I did my graduate uh, MBA program there. And both of us were able to get discounts for not just our, our higher education, if you want to call it that, but also because we we're uh, alumni of a certain school. Students get a discount because they are generally, if they're not on a parent or guardian's insurance, it's discounted because they're under the age of 24 generally or pursuing higher education as they refer to it. So both of those receive a discount. And the nice thing is my alumni discount, if you want to call it that, it, it goes forever. I don't get it just for the first year. It's just because I went to school, which I was going to do anyway. So it's really nice that um, we're getting some reward for that. Uh, and frankly, as you all know, teachers don't make anywhere near enough money. So any discounts that they can get for their service is great. That's good. So I appreciate your time today, Mike. Um, I think this was very important information um, to share as far as preparing financial literacy wise. It's not always about savings and budgets. Mm -hmm. It's always about comparison shopping and risk management and to minimize the risk one could take on and, and insurance is important. Um, but I do appreciate it. This session is being recorded. We will be uploading it to our J Inspire platform. So our educators and students will have access to it for 24 seven. And I appreciate your time today. My pleasure, thank you.